This is Brad Keefley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 13th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and also on the new Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website and the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why Alaska's fiscal situation increasingly reminds us of Brexit. Second, our nominee for the worst in the first batch of pre-filed bills. And third, the federal deficit crosses a bad threshold we haven't seen since the middle of the Obama administration. And now, let's join Michael. Well, the weekly top three, time to crack things off here. You've got a uh, comparison that you uh, have been thinking of more and more in your mind as you watch what's going on here in the state of Alaska. You said this reminds you of something uh, where nobody is satisfied, where there's a solution where nobody's happy in the end. I could think of several, but you're specifically thinking of Brexit. Let's talk a little bit about that. Right. So I spent a lot of time in Ireland and Scotland. I spent a lot of time in the UK on on, on musical uh, things, going to festivals, visiting friends and that sort of stuff. And so I've had had a lot of contact with, with the UK as it's gone through. Uh, Brexit and and increasingly as we go through the situation in Alaska, uh, it sort it reminds me a lot uh, of of what the UK has gone through with Brexit and sort of the end game uh, that that Brexit has come to uh, is is sort of the end game I'm beginning to to see uh, out there for Alaska as well. Brexit started out with with all sorts of good intentions. It started out that, that England was going, or the UK was going to be able to leave Europe as a whole. Uh, the, all of the UK would go together. It would be, it would, it would be its own entity again, as opposed to instead of being part of the European union, um, the, they'd be able to develop new and better trade relationships with, uh, uh, with, with the world. They wouldn't be stuck to what the EU negotiated with the world. The UK would be able to negotiate a separate trade relationship with, with the United States and with with Canada, which they believed would be better than what the EU has negotiated, um, and and the and and the UK would be able to would be freed of having to make contributions to the EU Common Fund, uh, essentially their contributions to the budget, um, uh, and be able to retain uh, those dollars uh, uh, back in the UK. And so it was going to be this bright new shiny world. Where the UK was all better off and and everything was going to was going to uh, work out well. That's sort of like how we've started off uh, uh, the Dunleavy administration. It was we were going to be able to same sort of three things the same as the UK. We were going to be able to cut spending, uh, reduce spending down to long term sustainable levels uh, at traditional uh, revenues, uh, restore the PFD, um, and get back in get back in. Uh, 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 complying with statutes uh, with respect to the PFD, and we were going to be able to do all that with no taxes. Uh, and uh, and we were going to emerge at the end of this, this, this uh, at the end of the effort with this bright, shiny world of uh, spending reduced significantly, uh, a full PFD and no taxes. Well, it didn't work out for the UK. Uh, uh, the EU, uh, which they had to negotiate the terms of the, of the, uh, of the, se- of the separation with, um, had significant problems with respect to the treatment of Ireland. Ireland is, uh, is, is Northern Ireland is part of the UK. The Republic of Ireland is a separate entity and part of the EU. Uh, the Republic of Ireland wasn't going to leave the EU. And so you had this border between Ireland and, uh, the, uh, and the UK in, in terms of Northern Ireland that, that created a, a significant and ongoing, uh, issue. 
Uh, and in the, in Alaska, we had the issue of the legislature didn't want to go along with the uh, with what the uh, the Dunleavy uh, <laughs> sort of the EU of the of this of this analogy. The legislature right. didn't didn't want to go along with uh, what Governor Dunleavy was proposing. Right. In the end, uh, what 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 has happened in the in the UK is they ended up. Boris Johnson came in and they ended up uh, in order to get uh, Brexit done. Uh, not the original Brexit, but but sort of this 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 revised, reduced version. In order to get Brexit done, what they've done is essentially cut somebody loose. Uh, Northern Ireland, which was has long been part of the UK, and and the original vision was uh, uh, that it would continue to be so uh, in all respects, uh, has sort of been cut loose. Uh, uh, Johnson's essentially agreed to put a border uh, in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and. Uh, and the UK and the remainder of the UK and uh, EU uh, uh, trade principles and AU trade uh, uh, rules will continue to apply to Northern Ireland. The rest of the UK will be able to, to go off on its own, but Northern Ireland will remain part of not 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 formally, but in in the, the way they've done the border uh, in practice, uh, essentially part of uh, part of the EU. And and now I and, and as we're coming to uh, as we're coming to uh, 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 back to Alaska uh, to finish this analogy, I think we're facing the same thing here. We're not going to be able to. We're not going to accomplish cutting spending down to long-term uh, sustainable levels. I think the last uh, on based on traditional revenues. I think the last session showed us uh, that uh, there's just uh, you're, you're not going to get those votes out of the legislature. Um, Restoring the PFD and no taxes I, as part of the original three goals. I, I think just like uh, what's happened with the UK, we're going to see uh, a piece of, of the puzzles just sort of lopped off and left behind uh, uh, as, we, as we get to a solution. And so the more, I, the more I view these conversations that we have about Alaska, the more I start viewing them in the context, just like Brexit, the more I start viewing in the context, who's going to get left behind? What, which piece um, is going to get uh, is going to get left behind as we uh, as as we move toward uh, toward a final solution? And 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 what was originally a fairly unified um, uh, uh, support for Governor Dunleavy uh, and and support for these objectives. When all three were tied together, is sort of is sort of breaking down, just like it did in the UK. It's sort of breaking down as you get into the battle of which piece is going to get left behind. Um, and it, and it's just it's it, it's a fascinating analogy to me, um, uh, but between the two, it's just may, maybe that's how all politics works. Maybe that's how all <laughs> issues ultimately are resolved. Something gets left behind. Something major gets left behind. But in this case. I guess because I've spent a lot of time in the UK. In this case, I'm seeing it clearly in that context. Some, who's going to be Northern Ireland? What what issue, um, and what what groups are going to be uh, uh, Northern Ireland uh, at the end of this? Sort of left uh, left on the other side of the fence as as everything else goes forward. Well, and I and I think that you know the art of compromise supposedly is coming to a conclusion where nobody is really happy. Uh, in the long run, and I think that's kind of uh, where we're at right now. We're not re- seeing any real viable solutions. Nobody's come forward with a with the magic bullet, so to speak, to try and and fix this issue. Uh, there are those out there that want nothing but the continuation of the spending, uh, which we have right now. Uh, our conversations with Donna Arduin yesterday kind of showed that uh, I mean this sustain this level of spending is unsustainable. Yet there are people out there that just do not want to to see that. Uh, there are others who are saying that uh, you know the taxation uh, is inevitable and and we you know we should get a handle on it now and and uh, that the PFD is an anachronism and and everything else. And I mean I just I don't know where the common ground is here. That's the problem. I think more than anything, there's not a lot of common ground in between the two sides. Yeah, I I uh, have have become a fan of of. Governor Dunleavy's scenario five uh, in the in the uh, in, in his OMB and to go back for those who haven't who haven't been following the OMB puts out a ten year plan at the time that the governor puts out his budget uh, this year OMB did that it's an excellent document for those who haven't read it, read it you should uh, it lays out five scenarios that are essentially uh, different different ways of resolving this issue 
and some of them are uh, uh, one of them. Scenario one basically is is Dunleavy wins with the entire original package. You cut spending, you preserve the PFD, uh, and you don't have taxes. But that is, but but you know, we tried that last legislature and 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 couldn't even get 16 to support the governor uh, on on the extent of the cuts that that had to. Uh, had to occur. And then scenarios two, three, four are basically other people, uh, other groups win, win everything they want. Uh, spending continues, uh, PFD cuts uh, and taxes uh, in, very, in various forms. Scenario five, uh, option five, uh, which is called the balanced approach, sort of says everybody loses a little bit, uh, but we all hang together in the end. There are significant spending cuts. Uh, about six hundred million dollars uh, a year on average from uh, the uh, the spending plus inflation, the inflation adjusted uh, spending pattern. Uh, about six hundred million dollars in cuts. That's huge. I mean, that's that's what we accomplished sort of last year after you after you included all the accounting tricks that were included in that. Um, and then uh, uh, PFD restructuring to PO, POMV fifty fifty. That produces about $700 million uh, in additional revenues over the 10-year window uh, uh, toward the toward the solution. You're, but you're still at POM. You're still at 50/50, but you're at POMV 50/50 as opposed to the current statutory approach. Uh, and that's got $500 million in new taxes. And that is sort of is sort of the equivalent of you get to keep Ireland, but maybe not maybe not as 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 great as you wanted to. You still get to you still have to do certain things. Uh, over on uh, uh, in, in the UK analogy, you still have to do certain things, but Ireland gets to stay stay a part of the of the UK from a trade standpoint. Um, and 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 there's an I I find a lot of value in in scenario five, but others don't. Uh, others say no taxes ever, no way, no how. Um, and so you know that sort of blows uh, uh, option five apart. Others say. Statutory PFD, it's got to be statutory PFD, uh, no compromise, no restructuring of the PFD, even though uh, uh, I think POMV 5050 is what Governor Hammond uh, originally envisioned. Um, and so, but but you got to you got to keep the statutory PFD. So that sort of blows it apart. Um, and and some say you know no spending cuts or or we or or we're going to cap spending at spending plus plus inflation, but we've got to keep it at spending plus inflation because otherwise you know you got to you've got to make choices and you got to make cuts in in K through 12 or you got to make cuts in, in other places in the budget uh, that otherwise are growing more rapidly than inflation, um, and so you know we we can't afford spending cuts. So you know as long as people are pushing. That that my issue, my particular issue, has to win. No other issues can win. Uh, I don't. I, we don't get there. Some somebody ends up being Northern Ireland. Somebody gets end up left out uh, at the end. Some issue just gets lopped off and and set adrift um, at the end. Um, uh, it, but you know, under under scenario five, everybody still everybody gains, everybody loses um, something. But I just I you know every time I I sort of wade into a discussion about these issues um, and talk about scenario five and what scenario five means, you know, you just sort of get buffeted by somebody said, no, no, we're not going to keep spending it at, at these levels uh, or we're not going to change the statutory PFD or we're not going to have taxes. Okay. Well, if you do that, then somebody's going to lose. So at the end of the day, somebody's going to be Northern Ireland uh, and gets, and gets cut adrift. And I'm not sure who that is, but, I'm not guessing the PFD is the one that wins that issue. Right. Well, it's going to be a it's going to be a huge battle. Uh, we're already again the sides are shaping up, uh, and as we were saying earlier, I don't think we've gotten uh, any further on this discussion. Uh, in fact, I likened it to the fact that you know we haven't even decided. We're still fighting about which room to meet in, let alone the actual details of what's going on. I don't know that we've even gotten to the next. Uh, um, you know, even gotten to the next phase at this point. If they can get beyond the uh, PFD issues, which I think is going to be at the core of this fiscal fight, um, uh, I mean, I think they'll be lucky. Um, and uh, I, I just, I don't see it as of now, but we'll have to see how it goes. Yeah, the problem with the PFD issue is you've got to resolve everything else. I mean, you can't resolve the PFD issue in the abstract and then say, we'll go to the rest of the stuff uh, uh Later on, uh, because you still have, if you resolve the, if you resolve the PFD issue any way other than 
uh, the leftover approach that Senator von Imhoff proposes, um, you've still got this huge fiscal gap. Uh, and and I don't think that people who want to fill that fiscal gap are going to give up on trying to take the PFD until they see another way that that gap is going to be is going to be resolved. So it, it's it's I mean, it, it's not a sequential. It's not a linear resolution. Uh, in my in my view, it, it has to come together sort of as a package. And, right. Holistically. Right. And, and, it, and it takes a while to put together a package. And. You know, we've been spending about six years at it. We haven't done it yet, so <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure an election year session is going to be the one that does it. Yeah, I mean, we can't even decide. It's like we can't even decide which room to meet in. It's not that we haven't even started on it. It's like we haven't even decided which room to meet in yet. Um, it's uh, it's pretty frustrating. Uh, James says, um, and I agree, I think, because I don't think a lot of Alaskans understand this. Alaskans need to understand that a POMV 5050 does represent a cut to the uh, to the PFD, uh, Brad, your argument is, of course, that it is not only was it uh, Hammond's vision that it also makes the PMV draw over the long haul more sustainable. If we can yeah, live within it, that means, it, it does a lot of good. It does a, a lot of good things. I mean, basically, um, uh, to go back to, to the issue on this, um, under the statu- under the current statutory approach, inflation comes entirely out of the state side. So instead of having a 50-50 after after inflation, after accounting for inflation, instead of having a 50-50 uh, split between uh, citizens and uh, or residents and the state, you end up having something like a, a two-thirds uh, or 65% uh, split for residents and 35% uh, uh, split for the for the state. Uh, if you read Hammond, I think I think he envisioned what he was really talking about is a 50-50 split after you take into account inflation. Um, it really didn't matter uh, before we got to this point in the in the state's fiscal situation where the state needed to take its share of the draw. Uh, it didn't really matter uh, that the that the inflation was coming out of the state side uh, because the state did, wasn't taking its draw, and so it, it was just sort of dollars that uh, uh, that were being that were staying in the permanent fund. Uh, anyway, but now if the state's taking its share, uh, the the 65-35 split that occurs under the current statute after inflation is uh, is is doesn't leave the state with its full 50 percent with a full 50 percent. So POMV 5050 is just another way of getting at uh, uh, applying inflation uh, or or both sides, both uh, both beneficiaries, both uh, the citizens uh, under the PFD. Um, and the state uh, paying a proportionate share uh, of the costs of inflation to inflation-proof the uh, the permanent fund. Um, the 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 but uh, the the OMB ten-year um, forecast makes the point that over the long term um, that uh, uh, POMV 5050 should result in the same uh, uh, P- uh, PFD rates or same PFD amounts. Uh, as the current statute does, um, that's 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 based on certain calculations and and makes some sense. But basically, I think POMB 5050 makes a lot of sense because it assigns inflation, inflation the cost of inflation uh, to both sides. It does it represents a cut in the sense or re- represents a reduction in the sense that it um, is different from the statute. Uh, but I think that difference from the statute is is fully justified once you understand uh, why you're making that adjustment and once you understand why inflation uh, needs to come out of both sides. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, again, uh, you know, the argument here, Brad, is that we are not living, you know, we're living well beyond our means. Our conversation with uh, with Donna Arduin yesterday, I think, brought that to the forefront where we started talking about comparatives in other states and everything else and even adjusting for inflation even adjusting for our remoteness we're well beyond where we need to be and it seems like we've almost uh, you know and and you know you've almost given up that that a lot have almost given up and saying we can't cut anymore and your argument is that it's because the the proof is in the pudding we've shown that we just don't have the political will to get it done am i wrong yeah michael you and i've been talking you and i have been talking about uh cuts and the need for cuts uh, uh, since since you know, 2012, at least me, the first blog post I put uh, out on this issue was in 2012, when when many listen when many in the state and some listening on this on to this to this 
radio uh, uh, program, uh, we're still advocating for spending. I mean, the Matsu Rail extension was a was a big issue back then. We had to spend for that, and and, and all sorts of other things that were that were out there uh, that we had to spend. But in 2012, you could see the situation coming, and I I did a piece in the ADN that I got a lot of criticism for. Uh, I did a piece in the ADN at the time that said, "Up, oh, we're running out of money, folks, and we need to cut back spending." Yes, I mean. Every there's been a broad recognition that we're spending too much. Uh, we need to spend less. We need to we need to cut back on spending. I've been an advocate of that. You've been an advocate of that. We we tried it last year. We tried to get uh, uh, spending down to uh, long term sustainable levels based upon traditional revenues, uh, and we saw what happened. Uh, the governor tried it. Uh, the legislature came back and said no. The governor did a round of vetoes that was about what, $800 million higher than, than, than our spending levels. Um, some of those got sustained. Other of those got undone uh, in the next round of legislative action. And the governor finally ended up about a billion dollars more uh, in spending than, than where he started, than, than the sustainable level where, he's, where he started. I don't see that. I don't see that changing. Talking about the weekly top three, we just got done with number one. We're moving on to number two. Number two is all these pre-filed bills, winners and losers, uh, there's some interesting ones in there. Uh, I would say that that uh, verse number two for the state song, boy, that's some important work going on right there. Uh, gotta gotta say, uh, there's a bill in there to prevent us from sending, uh, basically ties the hands of the commissioners of the Department of Corrections to send prisoners outside. Uh, Click Bishop's got a bill to uh, uh, to drop the threshold for veto overrides. That uh, just seems like a little bit of sour grapes there. Uh, and there's uh, one more. You've got your favorite uh, in here, or your, I guess what I would say your least favorite is, Brad. Where are you at here on the uh, the number one bills or the, the winners and losers here? I, as, I was, as I was buzzing through them quickly, one hit me as sort of the, the worst idea of, of all time and stood out to me as, uh, as the worst uh, proposal uh, that, that I've seen either in this legislature or, or, or in some of the ones before it. And it was Jonathan Kreese Tompkins' uh, proposal to amend the Constitution to eliminate the payback obligation for draws from the Constitutional Budget Reserve. Now, you know, stripping away all of the legal, legal language, basically what he's trying to do is cancel $16 billion of debt uh, that, that the current generation, the current and, and, and immediately past generations Owe to future generations um, to pay to pay back the loans we took from the constitutional budget reserve to get us through the uh, through the through the fiscal situation we faced over the last decade uh, uh, to to cancel those those paybacks and say to future Alaska generations too bad <laughs> we we used it all we're not going to pay it back. Uh, and and this reserve that's supposed to be transferred, this piggy bank that's supposed to be transferred from generation to generation to generation, so that so that each generation always has some some cushion that it can draw down uh, and be able to uh, sort of weather the the storms uh, uh, until they get to, to dry land. Uh, that we're just going to eliminate that piggy bank, and uh, and yeah, we used it all, and yeah, it was to our benefit. Uh, but too bad we get to, we're not going to have to pay it back. And I just think that's from from an intergenerational fiscal policy uh, perspective. I just think that's the most horrible idea ever. I mean, it's like saying it's like saying that the, at a federal level that, uh, yeah, I know we ran up all this twenty two billion dollars and twenty two trillion dollars, excuse me, uh, in in national debt. Uh, a lot of it in the last uh, decade. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, that coincides with what we've been doing in Alaska, um, and and I know we ran ran this up, and I know uh, we're supposed to pay it back, but we're just not going to. And uh, and future generations, that's just too bad. You know, we're just we just, we just, right. just s- suck this down, right? And, suck it. And took there advantage of it, and uh, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and well, you're stuck with it. Well, I think there's a deeper thing here too. I mean, not only was that just, I mean, first of all, on its face, I just thought, wow. You just basically said default. You're going to just declare bankruptcy and just say, screw you, debtors, we're done. Um, but I think there's a deeper thing here. This has to do in part because it eliminates the sweep and the reverse sweep, which, uh, again, they were in a whole panic. And there was a, there was a lot of hand-wringing going on 
during this last session because they weren't sure that they had enough to uh, allow for the reverse sweep to take those monies back out. And, of course, that would have taken a lot of disposable income away from many of these legislators and their pet projects and everything else that was going on. And this is, I think, what the ultimate end game is, is to prevent that sweep and reverse sweep uh, on top of the fact that it basically says we don't have to pay back our debts. Uh, isn't that the deeper play here? Well, it's another part of the play. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure which I would count as deeper, uh, but it's another part of the play. Basically, it undoes, in that sense, it undoes the constitutional anti-dedication clause. I mean, the Constitution says you can't dedicate uh, uh, funds for a specific purpose, um, and what the what the sweep threatened was all of these little designated funds uh, that have been built up over time. Um, uh, PCE and, and, and other designated funds that have been built up over time, um, re- threatened taking those and throwing them back into the general fund. Um, and, and that was, I mean, you can do that because the Constitution has the anti-dedication clause, uh, and unless it's constitutionally dedicated, you can't, uh, you, you can't dedicate it for another thing. Th- this would undo that and allow the legislature to start creating all of these little, to continue to have all these little funds without threat of the money being thrown back in uh, uh, to the general fund. And yeah, that's that, that's that's bad. I, I mean, interestingly enough, the, the permanent fund is not, or the permanent fund dividend, uh, which previously was treated as designated funds, is not one of those that that the legislature wants to protect. But yeah, that's bad. But what? But but. I guess to me, at the end of the day, more bad is this generation just essentially cutting future generations loose uh, and saying, you know, you're not going to get the benefit of of this reserve account, of this of this savings account, of this uh, of this uh, 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 storm proofing account. Uh, you're not going to get the benefit of that. We're we're just going to take that all to our generation and just and just forget about it going forward. You know. That would make sense. What what really strikes me as odd about this is that would make sense um, if it were a baby boomer uh, uh, that was essentially saying, "I don't want to have to pay this stuff back," um, and so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wipe out the the cancel the debt obligation. Uh, but this is a millennial. I mean, Jonathan Chris Tompkins is a is a millennial, sort of the archetypical millennial uh, in the legislature because he talks about being a millennial all the time. Um, and and they're the ones that are going to be hurt the most uh, by this. They're the ones who aren't going to get the benefit of the constitutional budget reserve uh, uh, going forward. So, it, I, it, you know, I, the designated fund aspect of it uh, is is problematic, but but this generation being so egotistical uh, and and so. Uh, thinking about only about themselves uh, and saying we just we're, we're not going to have to pay this back. I, that to me is the is the is the bigger impact. Well, speaking of not having to pay things back and the national debt and everything else, that actually brings us to our top the door three of our top three. We got about three minutes here, uh, and uh, it's the national debt. I mean, so you know, monkey see, monkey do. As goes the nation, so goes the state. This is a big issue. It is. We have we have now crossed. Um, there's there's articles in both the uh, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times uh, noting this. We have now crossed uh, over again into trillion dollar debt uh, territory, trillion dollar annual debt. Last time we had a trillion dollar annual deficit uh, in the federal government was 2012 um, uh, at the height of the Obama administration, fiscal year 2012, at the height of the Obama administration. In response to that, uh, Congress passed in 2011 the Budget Control Act uh, that required uh, um, uh, put limits, sort of a spending cap, if you will, uh, on the federal government. Imposed uh, various provisions that required that spending be brought down. Uh, and over the course of of the subsequent years, it was brought down. We were down to uh, 440 million dollar deficit, uh, roughly um, a two point. Five percent of GDP, historically, uh, even historically, a fairly low rate of deficit by 2015, brought about by the Budget Control Act. Um, but now we're just we've 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 unleashed the reins uh, again, uh, and since 2015, we've built up 
uh, uh, deficits again, um, uh, added by fueled by a lot of things. One of them is the is the 2017 Tax Act that uh, didn't pay for itself. Other is, others are increased spending packages that have been uh, uh, negotiated between the Congress administration and the administration, and then signed by the administration. And now we're back up right where we were in 2012 with one trillion dollar debts, one trillion dollar uh, uh, one trillion dollar debt, and not only. Are we back at a, a trillion dollar debt uh, currently? But when you look forward, when the when the Congressional Budget Budget Office does projections forward, uh, this is this isn't the high water mark. Congressional Budget Office on our current track, the Congressional Bu Budget Office uh, uh, predicts that we will be or projects that we will be at a two trillion dollar debt annual deficit uh, by fiscal year 2029, and where we were at. Uh, a deficit of 2.4% of GDP in fiscal year 15, we will be at a, at a deficit of 7% of GDP by 2029. These are things that we need to be looking at. I mean, this is real. This is this is crunch time. And everybody just seems to be thinking, oh, we're doing great. Don't worry about it. It'll all be fine. Mathematics says that's not the case. This is the problem. Um, I, I see a lot of folks out there who are... Um, Again, defending the position of not just, I mean, the president and the Congress, and I know a lot of these people, they make this about the president necessarily, but this is a this is a combined problem. President and Congress just continue to spend, uh, you know, an infinitum, and you start talking about, oh, not just $1 trillion deficit, but $2 trillion deficits. We put more into the debt in the last three years than, you know, than the, the, like the previous eight and we're all okay with that. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Uh, just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. This is, I mean, this could be potentially catastrophic. It is. I mean, it, it's just we we are we are kicking an ever increasing ball down the road uh, to to future generations. There was an article in Reason magazine, which I know that you uh, you read a lot and and cite on here. Uh, that says uh, this generation is basically just, you know, continuing the good times for itself by spiking the debt and throwing additional money into the economy to keep the, uh, the keep the economy up. But it's going to come crashing down on future generations. Uh, and for those who read Reason magazine, I think it's a I think it's a great analysis of, of what we're doing. It, it It is. I mean, it's bad in all sorts of ways. It's we haven't quite run as as, as high a national debt or deficits. Uh, the last three years than we have than we have the last eight, but we have run higher deficits. We're just we're just starting into the third fiscal year of the Trump administration, the third the third budget of the Trump administration, and and either next month or the month after, we're going to have racked up more debt in the Trump in those three in those two plus a little bit into the third year of the Trump administration than the last term of the Obama administration, the four years of the, la of the last four years of the Obama administration combined. Um, that's the that's the rate at which this debt uh, at which this debt uh, is increasing. I know that will stun some, but it's true. Um, we, and, and, and another thing, all of the all of the control we got out of the Budget Control Act of 2011 um, that was the whole. That was the sort of the culmination of the entire Tea Party effort to bring government spending under control. The Republicans and the administration negotiated the Budget Control Act of 2011, which put on uh, uh, sideboards and and really did help ramp debt down, uh, uh, deficits down to uh, a very low amount relative to GDP by 2015. This the 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 the, the spending bill, the appropriations bill that Congress just passed with Dan Sullivan, Lisa Murkowski, and Don Young voting in favor, repeals the Budget Control Act uh, of 2011, repeals the sideboards. So not only not only are, are we running higher deficits, not only have in, in, the, in the span of two plus a little bit more years of the Trump administration racked up higher debt than in the last four years of the Obama administration, but we repeal the very control uh, that that we had that at least limited uh, those deficits some. That's why that's why CBO is saying by 2029 we're going to have two trillion dollar deficits. We, this gener this generation is just just dumping on future generations in a way that is uh, historically unprecedented. We've never had 
uh, a situation where one generation has done this to a future generation. Brad Keithley is our guest. Uh, Brad, uh, this goes back to what we were just talking about yesterday. We were analyzing Ed King's um, Ed King's uh, 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 predictions for this next year. And, uh, you know, he basically said, look, we're, there's going to be a reset. There's going to be a recession. There's going to be some ugliness that's going to happen. And this is going to contribute to it. I mean, you, again, you cannot continue to spend more than you take in uh, year on year uh, and expect that in the long run, this is all going to uh, this is all going to just you know work out in the long run. It, it it you can't you can't just pie in the sky, stick your head in the sand, and say this is what's going to happen. Yeah, and and you know even even under assuming continued favorable circumstances, assuming no recession, assuming no additional need for uh, uh, additional debt to to get us out of a recession. Um, CBO has done some some numbers that show that even on our even even without any of that on our current course, we're reducing incomes uh, out in 2049 for those who will be here in 2049 uh, by more than 10 percent uh, solely because of the additional debt, the additional interest costs, the additional constraints on fisc fiscal flex flexibility that we'll have as a result of what this generation is doing um, on the debt side. And it's just, I mean, you, you can see it coming. You can see these consequences coming. Um, and yet this generation just continues to rack up uh, debt on debt on debt. Some, some people want to blame it uh, on the Democrats. Well, you know, most of the additional debt that, that is being attributed to the Trump administration um, uh, occurred is, is a result of legislation passed while the Republicans controlled the White House, the Senate, and the uh, and and the House, uh, there is some more that's been piled up since the Democrats took control of the House. But this isn't a party thing. This is a this is a Washington out of control thing. And 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 one more time, Washington has voted to release the sideboards, has voted to terminate the Budget Control Act of 2011, uh, which which was the very thing responsible for getting it back under control the last time. Yeah, absolutely. This is a politician problem. This is not a party problem. This is a politician problem, believing that they know better than us and that they can manage the crisis uh, better than uh, than the free markets and everything else. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. I appreciate it. Uh, always, again, always good stuff. Sometimes a little scary, sometimes a little... Uh, uh, you know, uh, disheartening, but that's uh, that's what we have to look at. We got to look at the truth here. We can't look away. Yeah, but Michael, at least this time I didn't make you look for the seven second button. So. That's exactly. You good job. Good job. <laughs> good job controlling the O the O S button. All right. Thanks so much, Brad. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having. Me. I appreciate you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.